I'm Abdul Bagayev. I am from Northeastern University, where I work with Professor Peter Desnoyers. I'll be presenting Skylight. It's a methodology for characterizing disk drives that use shingled magnetic recording. This work was supported by NetApp and NSF. So what is shingled magnetic recording, or SMR for short? It's a new way of writing tracks on the disk platter. SMR increases disk capacity by fitting more tracks onto platter than conventional recording. This increase in capacity comes with an increased complexity. SMR disallows random writes, which complicates uh, data management. To understand how SMR works, let's first see how tracks are written in conventional drives. This is a simplified view of the of this drive internals. There's an actuator um, that positions the head assembly on the platter. Tracks are read and written using this head assembly. When we zoom into this head assembly, we find that there's a wide right head and a narrow read head. This asymmetry in width is for magnetic reasons. In conventional drives, the width of the drive, uh, the width of the track, sorry, in conventional drives, the width of the right head determines the track width. Here we see three tracks that are written at the right head width. Reading a track happens at a narrow read head width. Keeping the track width at the right head width guarantees that all writing any of the blocks in any of the tracks does not interfere with any other blocks. For some time now, these drive manufacturers have been shrinking both heads um, so that they could fit more tracks onto platter. <coughs> Sorry. They have reached the limit. <coughs> they have... Sorry. <coughs> they have reached the limit for the right head. Uh, for magnetic reasons, it cannot be made any narrower. Shingled magnetic recording reduces the track width from the right head width to the read head width by writing tracks on top of each other. This process looks similar to laying shingles on a roof, which is where the technique gets its name from. Shingled recording leaves just enough space for the read head to read the tracks. Reduced track width results in more tracks in the same space, but this increase in capacity comes with a disadvantage. For example, let's say we want to modify this block shown by the arrow. When we overwrite it, we end up corrupting the blocks in the tracks below because we are writing at a wider width than the track. <clears throat> if we try to fix the corrupted block, we end up corrupting the blocks in the tracks further below. This fix cascades until we reach the last track at the inner diameter. In short, to write a random block, we need to perform a large read modify write operation. That is, we need to first read all of the tracks, starting at the affected track into memory, update the block, and then sequentially write back all of these tracks. We can reduce the number of tracks in this large read, modify, write operation by introducing guard regions. A guard region is a track that's written at the right head width. All writing any of the blocks in this fat track does not affect the blocks in the tracks below. The group of tracks ending at a guard region is called a band. In the picture, we see two bands, each containing three tracks. Guard regions divide the platter surface into multiple bands. These bands can be modified independently. In summary, the SMR interface allows us to read arbitrary blocks that were previously written, and it allows us to sequentially write arbitrary bands. Building on top of this SMR interface, Currently, there are three approaches to SMR drive implementation. Host-managed SMR drives report the bands to the host using extended ATA and SCSI command set. The bands in these drives can only be written sequentially and can only be read after being written. Random writes or reads before writes will fail. Host-aware SMR drives also report bands but do not enforce sequential writes. These drives handle random writes and are therefore backwards compatible. Standardization of host-managed and host wide drives is still ongoing. As of yet, there are no such public drives. Finally, the last type of the, drive is a, of the SMR drive is the drive-managed. 
These stripes hide the complexities of SMR and expose the block interface. They are a drop-in replacement for the existing disk drives, but with radically different performance characteristics. My talk is about characterizing these drive-managed SMR drives. Drive-managed SMR drives present a standard rewritable block interface that is implemented by an internal shingle translation layer, or STL for short. STL is a firmware that runs inside the drive. It adapts the SMR interface to the block interface similar to the flash, transla uh, flash translation layer used by the solid state drives. A typical STL manages the block of the disk as a set of bands that store data. Since all writing random blocks is not possible, a small region of the disk is used for staging random writes. This region is called the persistent cache because unlike volatile cache, it retains the contents after a power cycle. One can also use non-volatile memory like flash for the persistent cache. The persistent cache uses the size of the incoming I.O. as the mapping size. This variable sized mapping scheme is also known as the extent mapping. The rest of the disk is mapped at the band granularity. At a steady state, the blocks are stored in the bands and the persistent cache is empty. When the host writes to random blocks, the drive logs host data to the persistent cache and updates the persistent cache map. For example, let's say that blocks 5 and 100 are st statically mapped to the locations in the picture. When the host writes to these blocks, the data is written to the cache and the map is updated. Reads now have to go through this map to see if the new data is available. To accept more random writes, eventually the drive has to move blocks from the persistent cache to the bands by performing read modify write on the bands. A drive with aggressive cleaning starts moving, band, uh, starts moving blocks when it detects idleness. A drive with lazy cleaning postpones moving blocks until the cache is almost full. This was an introduction to the SMR. Now I'll describe characterization goals and the test setup. Here are the tests that we developed using Skylight methodology. Due to limited time, I will describe only some of these tests. In particular, given a disk drive, how can we tell if it's an SMR? How can we tell the type of the persistent cache? Is it flash or disk? In case of persistent disk cache, what is the layout and the multiplicity of the cache? What is the band size? Is this size constant across the drive? These are important properties that directly affect the design of a system running on top of these drives. To show the generality of our tests, uh, we emulate three SMR drives in which we vary these properties. Our tests then correctly infer the properties from the emulated drives. This gives us confidence in the properties that we infer from the real SMR drives. Skylight has a software part and a hardware part. The software part is a set of tests that launch crafted I.O. operations using FIO tool. We infer most of the properties from the latencies of these I.O. operations. The hardware part is a high-speed camera that records the head movements during these tests through a transparent window. We installed the window at Northeastern's clean room facility. It's encircled in red in the picture. You can see that the head is parked at the inner diameter. We convert these recordings to head position graphs. These graphs will help us to unambiguously interpret the latency numbers. They also allow us to discover properties that are impossible to discover using just the latency measurements. For emulation, we, emulated, we implemented STLs from the literature as Linux device mapper targets. These are kernel modules that act as a thin layer on top of a conventional drive. They export a pseudo block device to the user and internally behave like a drive managed SMR drive. To emulate a drive that uses a flash for the persistent cache, we layer the STL target on top of a linear target that redirects the cache blocks to an SSD. In total, we ran the tests on three emulated drives and two real SMR drives. In the emulated drives, we vary many properties. The table shows the properties that are relevant for the tests that I'm going to describe. That is the persistent cache type and its layout and the band size. These emulated drives run on top of a four terabyte conventional Seagate drive. 
the real smart drives are the five terabyte and eight terabyte Seagate drives. To save space, we only show the results for the five terabyte drive. All disks are, all these drives are the 5900 RPM drives, which translates to roughly 10 milliseconds of rotation time. This number often comes up during the tests uh, as we miss a rotation during, a sequ during sequential operations that we perform synchronously. It also means that writing a full track takes 10 milliseconds. Keeping this point in mind will be helpful in understanding the test results. In the rest of this talk, I will describe a test and give the intuition behind it. Then I will show the test results on the emulated and real uh, drives. The first test determines the drive type. It relies on the unusual random write behavior of the SMR drives. Since random writes, uh, since, since random writes is not possible in an SMR drive, incoming writes will be sequentially logged uh, to the persistent cache as they arrive. Unlike random writes in conventional drives, this will result in a fixed latency. Therefore, just by looking at the random latency graph, um, uh, we can tell the, if a drive is an SMR. In SMR drives with distributed cache, random writes across the drive space may still incur random seek time as the head seeks to different caches. To make the test robust against such drives, we restrict the random writes to a small region. In this figure, the top three graphs are for the emulated drives. The flat latency indicates that these are SMR drives. The fixed 10 millisecond latency in the first and the third drives is due to a missed rotation as the STL sequentially fills the persistent cache. The sub millisecond latency of the second drive indicates that it uses flash for the persistent cache. The fourth drive, identified with the label Seagate CMR, is a conventional drive as we can tell from the varying latency. The last graph for, is for the real SMR drive. The graph correctly indicates that the drive is an SMR, but it has two anomalies. Uh, first, 25 millisecond latency is too high for a block write, and second, there's a 325 millisecond latency at 240th write. To understand what's going on, we augment the latency graph with the head position graph. We see that the head is originally parked at the inner diameter. When the first write command arrives, uh, the head seeks to the outer diameter and stays there during the remaining writes. As an aside, this indicates that there's a persistent cache at the outer diameter. As we saw in the introduction, a write operation in a single drive updates the persistent cache map. This update has to be persisted before the write command completes so that the written data could be recovered in case of power failure. Therefore, every write is piggybacked with an out-of-band data that contains this map update. This accounts for some of the 25 millisecond latency associated with every write. For the 325 millisecond write, we see that the head seeks to the middle diameter, stays there for about 300 milliseconds, and then seeks back and continues with the remaining writes. We believe that the persistent cache map is stored at the middle diameter. At every 240th write, the drive collects the map updates from the persistent cache and merges and writes a new persistent cache map. Next, we experiment with different write sizes to understand the 25 millisecond latency. The graph shows that asynchronous random writes with maximum Q depth and with varying write sizes produce quantized latencies. For example, when writing with the maximum Q depth, all write sizes between 4K and 26K produce 25 millisecond latency. Recall that a synchronous 4K write was also taking 25 milliseconds to complete. As we increase the write size to 28K, there's a five millisecond jump in latency. Writes now take 30 milliseconds to complete. The latency stays at 30 milliseconds until the write size reaches the 54K, and then there is another jump. Given that the drive has a 10 millisecond rotation time, a five millisecond jump corresponds to a half track increase in the right size. You can read the details in the paper, but we believe the following is happening. When, we, when the host synchronously writes a block, 
The drive internally writes two tracks of out-of-band data followed by a half-track journal entry that contains the host data. This accounts for the 25 millisecond latency associated with a single block write. As you can see in the picture, a single block ends up occupying a half-track journal entry and wastes a lot of space. However, when, we, when writing asynchronously or with volatile cache enabled, multiple host writes are packed into the same journal entry. For example, let's assume that the maximum queue depth is six. We write asynchronously and with maximum queue depth. All writes are packed into the same journal entry, taking 25 milliseconds to complete. We slightly increase the write size. All six writes still fit in the journal entry, therefore the latency is still 25 milliseconds. When the write size grows so much that queued writes do not fit in the journal entry, the size of the journal entry increases in a half-track increments. This phenomenon, which we call journal entries with quantized sizes, is absent from the academic literature on SMRs. Although what we described here is specific to the drive we study, we think SMR drives in general will use similar techniques because first they have to persist the map update with every write, and then, and also they will want to minimize the rotational delay when writing to the persistent cache. The next test discovers the persistent cache location and its structure. This test exploits a phenomenon called fragmented reads. This happens when we sequentially read a region where some of the blocks were just overwritten. When reading these blocks, the head seeks from, to the persistent cache and back, physically fragmenting a logically sequential read. The seek time increases as we choose a region farther away from the persistent cache. The test uses this variation in uh, seek time uh, to discover the persistent cache location. It forces fragmented reads by performing skip writes, that is writing every other block in a small region, and then sequentially reading the region. Here's how sequential read of a fragmented re region looks internally at five terabyte offset in slow motion. The head seeks back and forth between the outer diameter and the inner diameter, reading one block after another. We already know from the head position graph in the earlier slide that there's a persistent cache at the outer diameter. Therefore, the five terabyte offset must be located at the inner diameter. This is expected since conventionally block numbering starts at the outer diameter and grows towards the inner diameter. That is the lowest offset is at the outer diameter and the highest offset is at the inner diameter. For every drive, we force fragmented reads at a, low of, at a low, middle, and high offsets. The graph of emulated SMR1 shows that in this drive, the fragmented reads have the highest latency at the lowest offset, that is at zero terabytes, and the latency decreases as we reach the highest offset at 3.9 terabytes. This indicates that the persistent cache is at the inner diameter. In the graph of Seagate SMR, the real SMR drive, the situation is reversed. That is, the latency is highest at the highest offset and it's the lowest at the lowest offset. Therefore, the persistent cache must be at the outer diameter. In the graph of emulated SMR3, the average latency does not change, which indicates that the fragmented reads at different offsets incur similar seek times. Therefore, the drive must have a distributed cache, which is indeed the case. The last test I will describe detects the band size. This test relies on the fact that cleaning proceeds at a band granularity. On the slide, you see a simplified version of the test that's less efficient and only works for the drives with aggressive cleaning. The paper has a general and an efficient version. We choose a small region that we estimate to contain a few dozens of bands. We write all of the blocks in this region in random order. We pause for a short period to let the cleaner run and clean a few bands. We then sequentially read the region. Most of the blocks will still be in the persistent cache and will be in random order. Sequentially reading them will result in varying latency due to random rotational delay. Once we hit the blocks belonging to a cleaned band, the head will seek from the persistent cache to the band and sequentially read the cleaned blocks with a fixed latency. 
At the top, we see re the read latency graph for the emulated SMR1. The flat region corresponds to the band, which we can correctly infer as 40 megabytes. The read latency graph for the emulated SMR2 also clearly shows the cleaned band. However, uh, since it uses flash for the persistent cache, reads from the cache have sub-millisecond latency. For emulated SMR3, we can again correctly identify the band size to be 20 megabytes. Finally, for the real SMR drive, the band size in this region is 36 megabytes. When we repeat the experiment at different offsets on the real SMR drive, we notice that the band size decreases as we approach inner diameter. Again, the paper has the details. In conclusion, drive-managed SMR drives are a high-capacity replacement for the existing disk drives, but with different performance characteristics. Using them efficiently will require changes in the upper layers of the storage stack. To guide these changes, we developed Skylight. We took great effort in making Skylight as general as possible, yet there are many degrees of freedom in SMR design, and more work may be needed to achieve adequate generality. We plan to extend Skylight as more drives from different vendors become available. Thanks, now I can take questions. Kanevsky from Dell. Um, so what happens when the outer cache becomes full and the write continues? Is uh, uh, stalls? Yeah, so if you do really randomize across the drive space, then IOPS drops to near zero for a while, like 10 hours. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, uh, but uh, yeah, that's, a, that's a, like extreme workload. Usually what happens is if, you're, if you have realistic workload, then um, your writes uh, are inter um, they are they happen concurrently with the garbage collection, and you see the degradation of the IOPS. So, is a proposal then to you know, basically in your layer to interleave read and write to give more time for the write to be you know written from the cache to the internal? Uh, um, okay. I, I didn't get the question, sorry. Could you? Uh, I'm just trying to understand if uh, the application on a higher level need to change their behavior to be properly taken advantage of oh, that uh, in see. better interleaving read and writes versus trying to do long sequential writes, which was, you know, I mean, no, you common would, practice. I think you, would, you, wouldn't want to, um, you wouldn't want to do that, to inter, interleave uh, your reg regular workload with the cleaning process. So. I think it would be better to, like, uh, filling the cache takes a while. Like, um, f for fully random writes, it takes about 15 minutes in this particular drives. So I think ideal is to, like, make the workload such that um, you do not, you let the uh, cleaner run in the background for a while uh, to do the work and not to interleave with your, uh, with your actual workload. So just to mention, this is a desktop. Uh, we assume this is a desktop from the property. Since it uses aggressive cleaning, it assumes that there's a lot of time, a lot of idle time. Uh, actually, the uh, drive for server workloads would probably not use aggressive cleaning and would uh, wait, uh, would use a different algorithm that doesn't, uh, yeah, that doesn't aggressively start cleaning and therefore cause high latencies. So uh, I'm Joe from University of Nebraska. So uh, this is a uh, great work. So I have two questions. So the first question is uh, pretty similar as the previous question. So uh, based on a lot of literature, so uh, for example, if you are right, it's pretty sequential. And uh, for example, if you write, uh, if you issue a write beyond like uh, 100 megabytes, uh, it is right first writing to the uh, persistent cache and then moving to the uh, inter diameter or it's just directly moving to the... Yeah, so, okay, that's a good question. Uh, so basically the question is, if you do sequential writes, does it move to persistent cache? Does it, uh, so yes. uh, if you write with the uh, volatile cache enabled, uh, then 
we have noticed that uh, it writes at full speed. So it writes directly, it bypasses the persistent cache and writes it directly to the destination. But if you um, disable the volatile cache, then uh, all writes, independent of sequential or random, first go to the persistent cache and then go to the, uh, then, garb then clean, then they are cleaned and uh, written to the, their final destination. Okay, even, even the write is pretty large, it's also. What? Uh, okay, yeah. Yeah, thank you. I, I have a, another question. Okay. okay. So, um, like, uh, so I, I, I saw in your paper, so I remember, so uh, when you characterize your band size, you use uh, like garbage collection algorithms. So sometimes it, it I mean, it takes like a half hour to, because uh, the write normally didn't uh, trigger the garbage collection after maybe half hour. So. Do you have a left, like quicker way, some 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 method to quicker characterize the uh, like the band size or because yeah, if you use a like garbage collection maybe if, if you if want you to have characterize a, if you have a if you have a uh, I mean with aggressive cleaning uh, detecting band size is easy actually because uh, like it happens in a matter of seconds you. Uh, so this version of the test that I described here is uh, less efficient because it does full random writes of the whole region, but you do not have to do that. You can write just uh, like a, a few thousands of 4K writes, which, which is fast, and then let the cleaner run, and it basically finishes in a few seconds, like detecting the, with the ag aggressive drives, with drives with aggressive cleaning. With drives with lazy cleaning, uh, you have to actually wait for a long time. Basically, cleaning will not start until you fill the full cache, persistent cache. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right, let's thank the speaker and all the speakers in the session.